Uh, uh, hello, my name is Kate Longaro, and I am the current editor of the English version of Café Babel. Um, Café Babel started in 2001. It's a participatory journalism project um, run as part of the Nonprofit Association of Alba International. And our goal is to have participatory journalism, to have young people involved in a European public sphere, or what we hope to create as a European public sphere. We are um, a multilingual publication. We publish in six languages, in French, Spanish, Italian, German, Polish, and English. Uh, we are also a transnational organization, focusing on news from a European perspective, but also a young perspective. We're trying to get youth involved in Europe. Our target audience is 18 to 25. Um, we're also trying to give a voice to the so-called Erasmus generation and get them involved in something like, like Brussels seems so far away for so many young people and to get them really interested in what's happening and what's happening on the ground in Brussels and to be involved in those important decision-making processes. Um, we are based in Paris, uh, in France, and we are based on a network of volunteers uh, that are participating in the project. And we have local teams throughout Europe in cities like Budapest, Athens, Warsaw, uh, Berlin, um, Strasbourg. And they do reporting from their cities back to um, headquarters. But the idea is actually that we are facilitating their conversation with the European public sphere. And it's not necessarily about um, one editor saying, you have to write about this. It's about young Europeans expressing themselves and what Europe means to them and what their European identity means. Um, my name is uh, Ben Pekovnes, and uh, I do research on how politicians and political journalists are using social media during elections here in Norway and in Sweden. Uh, but I'm also interested in the use of social media and politics in general. And something I think is important to remember is that in order, in order to understand how social media is used in politics, we have to have an understanding of the political system, the media system of the political culture in the context you're looking at. Uh, and that's also related to the EU context. And in the EU context, it's an international election with national candidates, and it's covered by national media with some few cross-national publications, such as the EU Observer, uh, which might explain why it's hard to get the common uh, European uh, public sphere. Um, but on the other side, we do see there's, there's at least one topic that engages people all over Europe, and that's the Eurovision contest. Uh, and when you look at the numbers, the Twitter numbers, the, the statistics, um, uh, the Eurovision had 2.5 million tweets on one evening uh, versus the EU election, the EU hashtag EP2014 had uh, one million tweets in one month. So it's a huge difference. So it just shows that it's possible to have a common conversation about the European topic. Um, but uh, it's, it's harder when we have national uh, candidates. Uh, but the difference this time was that um, you have TV debates among the candidates, and Twitter was institutionalized as uh, um, a channel, uh, EP2014, was used heavily. Um, but still, I would argue that it's very naive to believe that social media is going to change everything, uh, that social media is going to revolutionize uh, political participation. Even though people can uh, have their say, they're not necessarily, necessarily using that opportunity. Uh, but still, I think there's some changes going on. I just want to mention some numbers we see from, uh, from Norway, is that from 2011, 12% of the population followed a politician on Facebook. And in 2012, the number is 17. And uh, I have some <coughs> preliminary numbers for 2014, but we see a clear increase. So um, in general, we see um, uh, clear changes when it comes to politics and social media. Um, but um, um, 
the, the big, big challenge uh, for, uh, for European public sphere is how to deal with it uh, across borders, and uh, particularly across languages. So, but uh, the continuing conversations. Thank you. <coughs> My name is uh, Stefan Jörgensen. I'm a journalist in a weekly called the Norden Banner. That's a very old-fashioned newspaper because we only publish about 20% of the for free on the internet. We also open the rest of the stories up as a mix, but we're not really, we have not really gotten into this new world. We're still struggling a bit with which strategy to choose and how to make money on it, like so many other medias. But since our print copy is still increasing in circulation, we feel that we have a business model that sort of works. That might be also because we are a focused media. We are not trying to speak to everybody at the same time. We have some specific topics we cover, like foreign policy, research, culture, and uh, it seems that we have found a niche in the market that really works. And, but of course, we have realized that we have to go online uh, 100% somewhere, and we're just not sure how we do it yet. Uh, I work with uh, European affairs. I do a lot of traveling around Europe, working also as an old-fashioned journalist, reporter, meeting people in the street, not just uh, reading uh, like uh, reports from news agencies, and I try to find out what's going on. And I meet people all the time that I become friends with on Facebook, and I keep in touch with them after I've got home. And this has been particularly interesting now in the conflict in Ukraine, where I've been a couple of times, and now I have friends there on Facebook, which they post things to me every day, like in my face. And this really changes the way you approach many things as a journalist. So I'm definitely sure that social media is extremely important for us as journalists that are going to work in the future as well. But let me just say something short about the issue here when it comes to social media and the public space, especially the European public space, which is the southern thing. I think that we can agree that there is, um, in the beginning, we, I mean, we have a very low European public space. It's small, but that doesn't mean that there is a small place for European affairs in different countries, because there, is, there are huge differences between countries. Is there a space sound there? Is yeah, there? it's almost feedback from the phone. Yeah. Okay, um, I, if you can compare two countries, like the UK and Germany. Uh, in the run-up to the European Parliament election, there was, in so many uh, German media, in TVs, in, 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 in print media, there were debates for months. And they were taking this concept seriously, that it was two major candidates meeting each other. They tried to make it a little bit looking like an American election. So I'm not really as pessimistic as our friend from Der Spiegel who was speaking here some minutes ago. I think that Germany actually did quite well. Uh, in many other countries, uh, in, in UK, for example, you don't have anything that looks like a European election like that because they have uh, they don't have the same interest in picking up these uh, European issues and presenting them from different angles and also inviting people from other European countries into their debate. I mean, I think uh, Jean-Claude Juncker visited 18 countries and participated in, I don't know, 70, 80 live TV shows in three different languages. He tried to do a job on this, but I think that uh, if we're going to work, we need to have a um, national public space that works in the first place to actually then invite these people and to make it, to become a platform for it. So I think that it's crucial to, uh, I mean, in, no matter what is going to happen with the, the development in social media, which is, I think is far too early to say. I think it's extremely important to know that we are still talking about countries that are very different when it comes to how advanced and how well-functioning the <coughs> national public, uh, public space for political debate is. And maybe there can be an interaction here. Maybe, maybe social media can be what improves also the public debate on international affairs in national countries. I think it's interesting the, the, the fact that um, I've been working with social media both commercially and editorially, and uh, most companies who does uh, social media commercially would never go into a new country and work there without having some locals who really knew how to talk in that country. And you were talking about also, Ben, that is it really easy to join the discussion on social media when it comes to European questions? It's easy when you have like 31 songs and you vote for the one you like the best or the one who is most hilarious. 
But is it really easy to discuss big European issues on social media? You know? Yeah. Um, I think it depends a lot on the topics, but there's lots of common topics. For example, Norway is not even an EU member, but the debate surrounding the EU detention directive was huge. It came way too late, uh, but still there was a huge debate and it went on for several years. Uh, and it also, uh, then it was also possible to involve uh, other European voices and opinions. So I think it has a lot to do with the topics uh, uh, on, the, on the plate. Uh, and how it's presented also in, in media. I also think media has a big job in explaining the topics in an understandable way. Um, I, I really liked your example about the Eurovision and that was actually something that I have been thinking about also myself. It's, it's uh, especially this year with the, with the Austrian winner that also created other sorts of discussions. Uh, one example that came to my mind about the youth participation and what kind of discussions we have been um, getting from them is uh, I think one or maximum two years ago there was a discussion about the Erasmus grants and the EU, were, the EU was trying to cut the, the number of or how much uh, Erasmus grants were, were given out and I think that, that caused uh, kind of a big uh, public outrage uh, among the young people and uh, uh, especially in, in the social media, people, uh, young people, they were um, uh, sharing their own stories about uh, their own uh, Erasmus experiences and saying that why they should not be cut away. So I mean, yeah, it really depends on the on the topic, but I think uh, that that is something that was working European wide uh, from from the south to the north and to, from the west to the east. <coughs> There is often some criticism against social media that uh, that it's too elitist or there is only people with a particular interest that participates in social campaigns or, or spreading uh, the information. But I think on the other hand that it doesn't really matter as long as you have all these different types of elites, all these people who are interested in different things. For instance, if you have a network of lawyers who are following the development and who have been giving law in a particular issue, they will spread the word immediately when anything happens. These people are all over, all over Europe, so they will also spread it further on to the journalists, which again takes it on to the, to the people. So it's actually the, maybe it's good also that you have many different and small networks of people who are communicating, because then you can have a specialized debate and you make what you post will become even more qualified. Hmm. Well, actually, when you're talking about networking, actually the network debate that's what we try to do at Candy Bagel is to get uh, young people involved on social media as well as in participatory journalism and publishing articles about European affairs and building a transnational European network of young people um, to try to communicate and sort of melt away the borders that are currently still existing um, but definitely we need to have a recognition also of national public spheres definitely I agree as well so very important um, but I really do agree that um, we like the, the only particular, the particular interest in social media for young people and the importance of social media, I think, for traditional media is also to get involved and to reach to young people on these networks and on these, because we are the digital uh, natives, the digital, digital native generation, and I think that we really communicate to each other via these networks and these channels, and if we are not reaching out to the youth via these channels, uh, we're losing a, the few, well, the huge portion of the potential audience, but also the future of, of the European project in general. Um, and making sure that it's sustainable, because if we can't convince young people that this is a good project, um, then we may have some trouble in the future. Yeah, I agree that you have to make uh, you have to make new media platforms because you cannot. Do, I mean, when the European Union is trying to do it themselves to facilitate something, it really doesn't work. I mean, so it's it's uh, initiatives like that are really important. So I really support that. Exactly, you said that 17% of the Norwegian audience follows a politician on uh, Facebook. Um, does, does this um, say anything about, do people follow only the ones they like, or do they follow the ones they don't like as well? Um, I've, 
I'm just in the middle of the process of analyzing numbers from 2014. I have more information later. But uh, based on these numbers, I, I can't tell. But um, uh, there's a tendency in, uh, in uh, research that people are following uh, politicians they like or they have some sympathy towards. Uh, but the main um, reason for following politicians on uh, Facebook is to get information mm. uh, in order to, to make decisions, what are you going to vote for. Uh, but then we also need to remember what, what is the main argument for people to use uh, social media, and particularly Facebook, and that's to connect with friends and to greet friends with their birthday. I mean, it's, it's very social, it's very close to their heart uh, to, to connect with people and then keeping up with the news and keeping up with politics, that's alone at least some motivation of why people are using it. But still, we do see a change in the way young, or a, a difference between the way young people use it and uh, older people. So uh, young people are much more <coughs> um, uh, positive to, to uh, um, involve uh, themselves in politics. Uh, compared to older people, so yeah. So do you think people are aware about the fact that they get um, a version of the news that's tailored for them when they're on social media? Not necessarily. Uh, when it comes to how the algorithms on uh, Facebook uh, works, or uh, they, because there are many algorithms, um, I think that is complicated and there's not much transparency regarding that. Um, so I think that's not only related to young people, I think that's people in general. It's complicated to get understanding how the newsfeed is uh, um, manipulated or how it's built up. Uh, but that's related to what connections you have with people, what you like. Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's fairly, fairly complicated. I would actually have a question here for the journalist uh, sitting in the panel because, as noted, you're using a social media platform that has an algorithm that is not open, that is actually closed to how it exactly works, yet you use this platform to communicate information with and uh, try to reach audiences. How can you, especially as a quality newspaper, rely on these kinds of um, platforms which are like a black box to spread your information? I don't uh, rely on it uh, at all, <laughs> but I, I get uh, very important feedback uh, uh, when something happens. Like now with Ukraine, uh, people are posting stories that I can check out. You know, I can find out what's really true. Uh, and things are happening so much faster now. You know, people are passing a truck; they think it's a Russian truck, and they just do it on their smartphone like this. And there are hardly any journalists in the area as well. I think it's it's like uh, there are lots of detectives around, you know, and they uh, and they send out information that are maybe it's mostly false, but still you uh, you get uh, you get some some threads that you can fight for on your stuff. But I would never uh, I would never trust it. It's the same way I cannot even even Wikipedia I cannot just go, you know. It's, uh, it's very hard to do that. I mean, I heard uh, journalists say a week ago that we use social media as. Uh, same way you use a bottle of water, he drinks it and uses it because it's convenient, but he hasn't cancelled his tap at home. So he yeah, just uses it as a tool to, to phrase his things around. Yeah. Uh, but I have a question both for the panel and for everyone here. It's how to deal with different languages. Uh, because that is so complicated when you want to, to create a common uh, European sphere and you have so many different languages. And when you look at the um, uh, analysis of the Twitter data from the European election 2014, something you see is that the British publication, they're in the middle of all these national clusters. You have Germany, and then you have Spain, and then you have France, and you have the Scandinavian countries. So, and in the middle we have all the British uh, media, because that's something everyone can how do you create a conversation with so many languages? <laughs> I think I can answer that. Um, so one of the concepts behind Café Bevo was that every European can publish in another tongue. That was the original goal of the publication. 
and you still can publish in any language. We have a community section where you can publish articles in any language you, you want. And then there's the six main languages of the magazine. And so our magazine actually relies a lot on a network of translators. We have people that translate into every one of the six languages, from French to Polish, for example, or from Polish into English, because we want to make sure that everyone can at least, hopefully most, of, most Europeans can read at least one of the versions and are able to have access to information. And so for Cafe Babel, it's been very important to um, foster this rich network of translators and to encourage this dialogue across linguistic barriers because definitely in Europe that is the biggest barrier among communication is the fact that simply we can't understand each other because we don't speak the same mother tongue and it would be a shame to simplify Europe into one master language we could say like English which is convenient but um, you lose the linguistic diversity of this continent uh, and even of the European Union having 24 different languages um, it's just too complicated so, but it's wonderful. Um, so I think, to me, to be honest, I think that translating is very important and working across borders as well, as um, Elizabeth, that you observed, I had mentioned earlier, uh, this transnational journalism and getting involved in projects with journalists in different countries and building networks of journalists across the, the continent. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to give you some questions from the audience in a few minutes. So. If you have prepared one, you could uh, raise your hand and you'll get the microphone. Or if you're shy and just want the whole world to see it instead of just Zoom, you can post it with a hashtag on Twitter. So how, um, earlier today, uh, it was said that it wasn't necessary in the media's job to, to, to run these conversations and these debates. Um, do you have any opinions on this? How? Is it the media's job to be the hub of the conversations, to start them and to moderate them, or should someone else do it? I think uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's too ambitious to think that we can use uh, social media, or especially these debates and tools, and to really involve a lot of people. It's really, really difficult. So I think that it's better with uh, with smaller groups here and there. And then it can be media moderated, or it can be, you know, groups or friends or persons who are extremely active themselves who does it. But I think the diversity is just fine. I think that it's not. I mean, some somebody cannot be responsible. It's simply too big and it's, it's impossible, really. However, with that being said, I do think that digital media does provide a nice space for people to be able to debate and dialogue with each other in terms of. A platform like Cafe Babel or on Twitter or on Facebook, it's a it's a space, open space for discussion, um, and I think that this is a very this is a very important channel in rules that we can't um, eliminate. We need to make sure that we're keeping this as part of. I think it's the public sphere is moving online, obviously, also it's remaining um, face to face. But especially for young people, I think it's really important that we don't um, marginalize how the importance of digital and social media is. Um, so I, I agree with you, but I also think that there, that is a place where a uh, um, public sphere can come in, and I think that we're moving towards that, actually, to be honest. Uh, something we've seen many examples of is how um, traditional or established media has lifted a conversation that has occur occurred on blogs or on Twitter, and they've been given the topic more attention because they've seen that this is something people have cared about, they've debated it heavily or they share it, and then they give it even more attention through traditional media. And some researchers are, have started to talk about a social media logic. Uh, there's something called a media logic, and it's about how media operates. And now we are also looking at tendencies of a social media logic what is becoming popular, what is spread, um, stuff like that. So, so that's how we see traditional and social media is uh, very much intertwined. As for actually uh, the question in the beginning of is uh, a newspaper part of uh, a platform of debating, I think actually it is very strong, but in a different sense and really the, the, plan, uh, the discussion is on the platform itself. Because what happens at, you know, 
know, if I have the obvious and, uh, and get some coffee, then uh, you're going to discuss with your colleagues whatever was in the newspaper that morning or whatever headlines you read just a few minutes ago. So I think actually that uh, news outlets have huge impacts on uh, debating platforms. On, and I can understand if you do not want to moderate this and put this on your own site, but still the influence that uh, you have is tremendous and should not be underestimated in any sort. So maybe you even just want to get it away because you are part of it. So we will do some questions. Um, doesn't seem to be anyone who posted on Twitter. So does anyone here have a question? You can raise your hand. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, it's actually not my question. I found one on Twitter. Uh, it's Helen Mercier, who I met through uh, a seminar, who uh, was the uh, European uh, candidate for the European election. Uh, from uh, the radical left here from Denmark. And she uh, writes, the European administration is already happening. How did we get the politicians in here? Uh, okay, <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> um, something we've seen in the research we've been doing in Norway and Sweden is that together a conversation going on between citizens and politicians, that's a hard part. And it also has something to do with the, uh, the, the share, the, the numbers of comments politicians get in social media, uh, the number of comments they get on Facebook, on, on uh, Twitter, how are they able to respond to everything? They can't respond to everything, but they have to make a selection and have to explain to people how they're dealing with the comments and how they want to interact. So to be clear about how they're interacting with people through social media and to have better kind of monitoring systems, that could help them at least be part of the conversation. Um, I actually also think that to get published back from my own research done on um, a movement in Canada called I Don't Know More, um, the thing is that this idea of slacktivism and translates also into social media that people are not taking to the streets and demonstrating for what they want and the changes that they want. And so I think if you want to get the politicians to listen, you have to do a combined effort. You, can no, you can't just sign a petition online. You can't just tweet to the politician. You have to actually go and be demonstrating and saying, look, this matters to me. And you know your vote does count. And so you have to always remember that there's also the physical part of it that we can't forget about and that change is not just going to come by tweeting that's part of it and that's part of creating the dialogue but citizens have to be active in their pursuit of making the changes they want in society or there it just is not going to work they're not going to listen to us that's the truth uh, unfortunately um, because it's easy to ignore and especially when you don't follow people back for example a politician doesn't follow you and he's not necessarily going to reply to you or even see what you have to post to him if, or her, if, he's not, if they're not interested. So I think we also need to make sure that we don't sit us, hide behind our computers and try to escape our also responsibility as citizens to make sure that the changes we want in our country, in Europe, uh, on the European Union level, on the national level, that we can actually get these things happening. Um, and it should not just rely on digital channels, even though I'm very much a digital native and I love my digital channels, I'm also very much um, the active in civil society and making sure that what I want as a citizen is really happening on the ground as well. As a maybe final note on that, uh, I mean the market mechanism of not voting for them might work very well if you also announce it. I mean, if you say, yeah, this person ignored all my questions, and that one reason why I'm not voting for that person, then that might influence others in your surroundings and does work. Yeah, and even the, the water bucket challenge that everyone has seen, it's it's just water on your head, but it's still they still managed to raise over fifty dollars per second for several weeks. So it shows what your point that even lifting your finger off your keyboard and go grab a bucket instead helps. Any more questions from the audience? I was told there would be lots of uh, uh, clever Curious young people have lots of questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I would like to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I uh, I was thinking a bit about like uh, especially with the press, uh, the publication from the press people, 
uh, and there was a lot of uh, um, focus as well on, on this kind of sexiness of, of the coaching people and how you can how Obama does it really well and, and to reach out to people. But I'm thinking, is that like is that is that something that should be followed by as as a kind of ideal for the European way of communicating, or is it just the, like this superficial kind of apparent? Okay, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I think, to answer your question as best as I can, um, I think uh, at Cafe Babel, for example, we do, we cover a lot of hard topics about politics, society, and culture. However, it is true that we are in a media landscape where the attention span is a lot shorter than it used to be. People usually only read the first three or four paragraphs. Um, so it has turned towards click journalism has become some, a part of our industry. It's an inevitable part of our industry. What we try to do personally, me as an editor, what I do is when I have a serious article, um, I try to sort of make an ironic statement for Facebook or Twitter and, or a funny photo and get people to click on it to try to get them to drive them into the information that's interesting, um, into something that maybe is a serious topic they would think is too boring. Because unfortunately, we, we've kind of gotten to the point where of tabletization of media that sexiness, sex sells kind of thing, and if media is not sexy, or if we can't get clicks, or we don't have viewers, or audience, um, we don't have um, funding, for example, or we don't we lose advertising uh, revenue if you're more traditional media. Um, so I think that we're kind of, as a journalist, we are kind of between the rock and the hard place of saying, okay, we need to bring the information to everybody, but then how do we make get people to first click on the information and access it? Um, I think that's from my personal perspective what I see here. Yeah, a uh, quick response on that. Um, I think we also need to remember what kind of political system uh, Obama has been campaigning in and what political system we are comparing with. Uh, like in Norway, we have a party focused, uh, party centered uh, political system. It's harder to do that kind of personal campaigning, even though social media is perfect for doing marketing for individuals. So, um, but I think the, the biggest lesson from the Obama campaign in 2008 and 2012 has been the way they've been uh, organizing the grassroots and the way they've been doing the mobilizing more than the marketing of the candidate. So, as, uh, especially from the, from the Norwegian and Swedish political parties, that seems to be the the major lesson, how to be able to, to engage the grassroots. I think that uh, something can be both uh, popular and both really, really serious. Uh, and I think it, but it, I think it takes time how to, how, how, what you have to learn how to present stuff in, uh, in, uh, on the web, you know, it's, uh, because it, when you have the, the traditional media, I guess, uh, especially the print media, you had uh, you knew that people were you know just clicking one link, one link, just reading one from the beginning to the end, and it was a sort of you could just you know put anything on, and now it's sort of the competition is so high, people don't subscribe and they just uh, they sit around and they just get links. So you need it's a new profession to know how to present something, and the the, the cheapest thing to do is to have you know, some populistic messages. So it's like uh, somebody is wearing a bra or something, and there would be a lot of clicks and it would be sent around. But this is really not the, not the only way of doing it. There are so many other ways of presenting something and making it interesting. And there are all so many new techniques now how to make the material interactive and how to pull people into it. So, but I think it's going to take time before all these new techniques and all these skills are around in the media. Well, I, I do agree that you definitely need to present it a bit better. If I mean, if I hear about uh, a super delegate from Florida, I'm like, wow, what's that? I'm gonna look that up, and uh, that makes it a whole lot more sexy. So I think yes, you might be able to lift your skirt a bit and show a bit more. And uh, 
It should have, but let's not you know go too far on this. Because, like you said, really uh, copy the list or anything. No, I think you know there are some of the YouTube videos out there, instructional that still present something in a nice way. And well, get along with this, but please don't let the European uh, Commission do that. I think that's just very dry when it gets out. So it's up to us to actually present it a bit better. It's very important also to talk about that the responsibility of the people who are posting, who are taking part in the discussion online. So um, many of them are just um, not really thinking about what they are going to write. Um, they are just looking at the picture, just looking at the headline, um, at the eye catcher, as we um, just talked about. And then they uh, share an opinion, which is maybe not really funded and which maybe does not help the um, discussion. How to solve this problem, how to make people aware from their responsibility, what to tell the others. Um, I mean, something that uh, we were talking about as a future lab group when we were writing our opposition paper is that education, how do we educate all these uh, young and older people about how to, how to use social media and what is responsible and what is not. And I think uh, that, that is something that uh, all the school systems should uh, also start thinking about from the, from the early age. And, uh, you know, we know now that uh, younger and younger people are able to use the devices. For them, the technology is not a problem. But then also, you know, they start facing these, uh, all these dangers that can come with it. So I think, uh, I think it would be very, very, very important to, to start uh, focusing on, on what, uh, how, how people should, uh, should react and uh, what they can say, what is allowed in, in these certain, certain boundaries. Any more questions? Oh, a few more, right? Okay. Um, how free are we to express our opinions on social media? Uh, how free are we to express our political opinion on social media? And how, um, how far can we take our opinions without being um, taken down and blocked. I don't have the question. I, um, yeah. um, so <coughs> um, in my country, most of the people uh, consume their news mainly from Facebook. Um, and my question is. Uh, whether it's possible that social media might make our uh, knowledge about politics more superficial because people tend to post sometimes populist things uh, on, on social media. Okay, let's do the. What can you say first? <laughs> Anyone want to go on that? Quickly, just quickly. Um, we, we just had a case about how far you can go on social media in Norway, there was a professor at the University of Stavanger who had been posting uh, some racist remarks. Uh, and it was uh, not the first time he did it, and he, everybody who knows him knows that he's probably drunk when he does it. <laughs> but still, he, it, it takes a couple of days before he excuses himself, so there is a, a lot of media attention when he does it. So, uh, and everybody thinks he's, he's a huge idiot, of course, but uh, nobody knows how all the people who are not in the media react to that, how many, how many emails he gets, so what, what kind of network he has, <coughs> nobody knows, but still it's, uh, that's, that's his experience right now, posting racist remarks, if you're a sort of public person, even if it's your, in your private Facebook feed, that's not acceptable at all. Um, yeah, we can, you want to ask the other? On the first one, I, I think it. even the Norwegian court has decided if you have more than 20 friends, it's public, even if you have a lot of Facebook accounts. So, 21 friends, and you say something on your private Facebook page, it's considered public. Just to follow up on that, there's also a difference between liking something and sharing something, according to Norwegian court. Uh, it's, uh, if it's, for example, it's uh, racist material and you share it, then it's worse than if you liked it, because you redistribute. Um, 
so yeah, so there's even be a, a court case uh, regarding that. Um, and then you also have the, um, uh, the rules of the private companies <coughs> themselves, uh, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, and they also um, have to uh, follow, um, they, they monitor according to the rules. And then you also have the publication like VG, and you also have moder moderators. So uh, there's different rules in different spheres. Research done on uh, the actual participation uh, in in social media today uh, among uh, the really radical group that actually perform. Uh, I, I, we have our Amish day and day week in Norway and that kind of thing. But uh, on the continent, uh, do do the the people who really go far really use their social media as much as we do here in Norway? Anyone? Well, I can talk about um, an article that was written about Javik in Hungary, and um, they have been really act. I'm not. I don't speak Hungarian, but from what I've heard and from our sources in Hungary, is that they are quite active on social media, and they're actually quite good at social media because there's a lot of young people involved. Um, I've also heard the same about in the in Belgium. I believe um, it's the same thing. Um, so when you have young people that are really mobilized, actually you kind of risk that these digital natives then turn the gun towards, um, you know, they have the tools to to turn the conversation on the digital channels and social media channels to on a, in a more negative way. And to, they have they know how to be involved because it's not only marginalized. If, if you really have a good social media strategy, you're able to engage people and convince them of your um, pers political persuasion. So I think that it also depends on who's running who's in the party and who's active in the party and I think a lot more of these extreme parties that are being radicalizing youth and we've seen the radicalization of youth around Europe recently and I think that this is totally changing the conversation uh, on social media and really making them more present on all of the networks. I absolutely agree and this is uh, the situation in Hungary is that uh, one of the main reasons for the success of the movement is actually social media and but there was a question here that nobody answered, but it was about this, what happens in a country where Facebook becomes sort of the most important source for news, and this is uh, exactly why, why it is so important that we have so many different media channels and platforms, uh, how important that is to nourish that. And, uh, because I know that there are several countries who didn't really, especially some in Central and Eastern Europe, it was a hard time for them to build up a media system that was similar also to Western countries. And for many of these countries, this is, uh, they don't have the, the, the it's no traditional uh, strength in this media structure. So they are maybe also more vulnerable to, to social media trends of the more negative type. So definitely uh, we have to fight for as many platforms as possible or a huge diversity of platforms. And it's really important. Over time already. Uh, if you have more questions or remarks, you will find a mix of all the people who have been talking here today on the hashtag. If you just scroll up and down, you will find all the mix and you can ask, <coughs> obviously, ask people questions and continue the debate in the public space online later. Thank you. Thank you.